just can assume, not that you can solve every problem in field theory, but you, you've had a course in field theory, you're familiar with what's interesting about field theories. Uh, and then from here, we can talk about nuclei and structure. So, then, for example, elastic nucleon scattering. I'll tell you why we don't know how yet to do inelastic nucleon scattering. And we can also talk about deep inelastic scattering. And then, lastly, uh, something I've been working on lately, dark matter matrix elements. Okay, so. If I were taller, I could write higher. <laughs> Have a little more room. Sorry, you, I saw you just mentioned that uh, there is no scattering. Yes. So what do you mean the... Uh, Deep and elastic scattering? Right. Yes, what I mean is, you can com right now what we know how to do is compute moments of particle distribution okay. functions. Okay. And there's some new ideas that I won't talk about that are attempting to figure out if we can actually directly compute the particle distribution functions instead of having to go through the moment. <coughs> okay, brief review of QCD. Is anybody here? Uh, not familiar with QCD in some form or another, aside from the fact it stands for quantum dynamics. So we all know what quarks and gluons are, I assume. You've all thought about at least computing Feynman uh, diagrams involving QCD, quarks and gluons, if you haven't done it directly. Okay, so here's the QCD Lagrangian. In all its glory, without any of the indices, well, with only a few of the indices, The most interesting part of QCD is encoded in the gluon field strength tensor, which I just labeled G and nu. And then we have, we know we have fermions for now. Again, just remember to write a little figure. Up, down, maybe the strange fork we'll talk about. Uh, you have fermion fields. What do we have? We have a derivative, the standard, oh wait, I forgot my gamma matrix. So we have a standard derivative. Uh, we know it's a gauge theory. So I have a gauge derivative as well. So here I've explicitly written out the SU3 generators. And that is it. That's basically the entire theory. Well, this gauge field tensor, uh, as you know, is um, Looks similar to QED, but then there's this extra term because the gluons carry the color charge as well. And this is where all the interesting features of QCD come from. Uh, these TA, these are the generators. These are in the, the generators in the adjoint representation, meaning there's eight of them. Uh, and then our fermions, they come in multiple flavors. So we know it's up, down, strange, charm, bottom, top. Uh, for low energy hadronic physics, we only care about up, down, and sometimes strange. And then top and bottom if we want to talk about flavor physics. Uh, so 
So we have a fermion that is flavor <coughs> F spin alpha, which you'll know is suppressed in this equation here, the spin, so these are matrices. And so really I could put an extra fermion spinner index here, and this is a matrix of spinner indices, I can say alpha, alpha, beta, beta, and here I have a identity matrix in alpha, beta. And then it comes in color A. And the fermions, as far as we know, are in the fundamental representation. So there's three fermions, or three colors for each quark. And then we have our gluons. So these gluons are actually matrices. Eight gluons. So what do we know? QCD is an SU3 color gauge theory. So of course you know the color of SU3 has nothing to do with actual color of light, of course, it's just an analogy. And they're called red, green, and blue gluons because, as you know, if you take red, green, and blue light, it becomes white light or colorless. And so that's just the analogy. And that's because we observe that even though the theory describes interactions between these quarks and gluons, we don't actually detect gluons in our detectors. So these are massless particles. Why don't they come streaming out to the detector? You know, like the photons do. Uh, these quarks are never found in isolation either. And so there's some postulated confinement mechanism. So the postulate, of course, is all matter has to be colorless. So that's where this SU3 color gauge theory analogy came from. And so it describes the interaction between massive fermion and massless vector gauge bosons. So that's not, all right, so the point is, it's a color gauge theory. So the most important symmetry of QCD, or the most important feature, I should say, not maybe bad you call it symmetry, feature. Feature of QCD is the uh, gauge covariance. So what does that mean? Of course, you know what that means is the mass of the gluons is strictly zero. It's a mass term is forbidden for the vector gauge boson. And what else do you know? There's lots of interactions in QCD, and in order for the theory to make sense and be renormalizable, the gauge symmetry is absolutely essential so that couplings and different interactions are related to each other. That's the only way the theory is renormalizable without having to add new operators, is the gauge covariance. Okay, but that's not the only symmetry of QCD. So there's other symmetries. And really what I mean is there's other approximate symmetries. Approx. Okay. Uh, I've always been bad at spelling, so forgive my Spelling mistakes I make as I make them. I don't even know if it's A or I, approximate A. We'll make it up. But in your own notes, you should spell it correctly. <laughs> okay. So, and these are equally important for understanding the longitude of analysis of QCD as the gauge symmetry. 
I mean, we all call it gauge symmetry, but we, get, we should remember it's not really a symmetry in the same way that we think of like a flavor symmetry or I guess that's one of the one that comes to the top of my head. It's a redundancy in the description of the theory. That's what we mean by gauge symmetry. So we write down four components of the vector boson where we know because it's massless, only two of them are real. So there's a redundancy in the description, which is why you get into all the but they have pop-up ghosts and stuff. Okay, so what is the approximate symmetry? Well, if you look at the Lagrangian, and let's start by consider just the lightest two quarks, up and down. So take this Lagrangian, only consider the up and the down quarks. Well, what we do know empirically is the mass of the up and down quarks is very small compared to any other scale in QCD. Um, so you could imagine as an approximation scheme, what if I first imagine those quarks are massless? Consider just up and down. Consider the limit m, u, and d equals zero. And then what do you have? You have a Lagrangian. Uh, I'll just write down the fermion piece of the Lagrangian. It decomposes into separate left and right fields. So here, I'm dropping the flavor indices. So these, uh, well, I'll write it down. So here, uh, side left is one minus gamma five over two psi. Psi right is one plus gamma five over two psi. And psi is a doublet under this up-down flavor symmetry. And so if you start with this Lagrangian, you notice that the Lagrangian itself possesses a U2 left for us, U2 right symmetry, meaning I can independently rotate the right quarks between up and down with an SU2 symmetry, like using the polar matrices. I can independently rotate the left fields, so that's the left-right part. And in addition, I can arbitrarily add a U1 phase to the right or the left. So this Lagrangian is completely invariant under this U2 left cross U2 right symmetry. Uh, but what do we know? We can look at the world and we can see the spectrum of QCD is very rich. And if nature respected that symmetry, what would be the consequence? Well, one of the consequences would be there would be degenerate parity partner states. But you can look at the spectrum, and what do you see? We know we have pions, rho vector mesons, nucleon, delta, there's the N, uh, one half plus, no, that's the nucleon, the N one half minus, and the N star, that can keep going. So this is the pi, the rho, proton neutron, the delta resonance. This is the uh, negative parity, no. This is the roper. Oh, did I get the bar on the wrong? I'll just call it the roper. So it's a nuclei, excited nuclei state. It's, it's a radial excitation of the nucleon. And then there's the negative parity nucleon. And uh, so if this symmetry were respected in nature. If so, this is a, a global chiral symmetry. Chiral meaning chiral is the, is the Greek word for hand, and it's left and right handed are different, so it's a global chiral symmetry. So if this, in global meaning 
unlike the gauge symmetry, you rotate all the U's ever in the universe at the same time into these, or vice versa. As opposed to the gauge symmetry, which is the local rotation. This is like a global rotation. Uh, so if this global spiral symmetry were respected by nature, then the mass of the negative parity nucleon would be at least approximately equal to the mass of the nucleon. And the approximate is, this is in a world where I'm considering the up and the down quarks to be massless. We know it's not true in the real world. But in the limit, this would be the consequence. So how do you see that? Uh, if you take your parity operator and act on side left, what is this? This is gamma 0, 1, minus gamma 5 over 2, psi left of minus x. You move gamma 0 through, you get 1 plus gamma 5 over 2. So it becomes, oh sorry, this is just psi. Psi of minus x, which is equal to psi right. So your parity operator transforms left-handed into right-handed fields which is why you'd expect this degeneracy. But as you may know, the mass of the nucleon, the proton, is about 940 MeV, where is the mass of the, nu the negative parity nucleon is uh, 1535 MeV. So it's nowhere close. What else do you observe in nature? All these hadrons, except for the pion, so the mass of all hadrons composed out of up, down, and you know, maybe we can throw in the strange quarks if we want, have a typical mass that's approximately equal to one GeV within a factor of two. Except we have the mass of the pion, which is about 135 MeV. The mass of the pion is much, much less than the mass of any other typical hadronic scale that's generated from QCD. So all this is to say, it's what's staring you in the face is even though the theory has this global chiral symmetry, nature does not respect that, meaning the dynamics of QCD do not respect that. The vacuum of QCD spontaneously breaks this symmetry. So if the mass of the quarks were actually zero, the pions would be the Nambu Goldstone bosons. They would be massless mode. But in nature, the quark masses up and down aren't exactly zero. They're just close to zero. So the mass of the pion isn't zero, but it's pretty darn light compared to anything else. And so then we can develop a per perturbation theory in this light quark expansion. And that's chiral perturbation theory. So the postulate is, and I say postulate because we can't actually prove this with pen and paper. We can only make the postulate and see how the predictions compare with the real world and now with lattice QCD. And there's absolutely no indication to think that this is wrong. So we postulate the QCD vacuum spontaneously breaks the symmetry. So we start off with u to the left cross u to the right in the vacuum of QCD, which we can denote somewhere or another, breaks this down to the u to vector subgroup. OK, so what do we learn? about spontaneous symmetry breaking. The Nambu Goldstone theorem tells us for every generator that is spontaneously broken, there has to be a massless degree of freedom. How many generators do you have in U2? There's the three from SU2 plus the one from U1. So there's four generators. So if I start here, we have four plus four is eight generators. And we break down to four generators. But there's only three light degrees of freedom. So 
degrees of freedom, DOF, short for degrees of freedom. The pi, so this is the pi plus, pi minus, and pi zero. So there must be something else going on as well. So this is just a roundabout way of saying QCD is a highly non-trivial theory. So there's something else going on that's causing us to only get three light degrees of freedom instead of four. And uh, the path integral formalism, so you should go study Fujikawa's method, uh, is a great way to understand. So you know the answer already. The U1 axial rotation is anomalous, meaning it looks like it's a symmetry when you write down just the Lagrangian, but you, when you write down the full interacting field quantum field theory, it is not actually a symmetry of the full field theory. And so it is an anomalous symmetry. So U1 axial, or left minus right, is not a symmetry. And so since it wasn't a symmetry to begin with, what we really have is U1 vector, which is otherwise known as baryon number, cross SU to left cross SU2 right. And so then the vacuum of QCD just breaks the SU2 symmetries down to the SU2 subgroup. And so you get three pions. Okay, so how do you see that? You start off with the vacuum of QCD. And we can take the right left combination. See? So we have a Q bar Q, and we're going to postulate that the vacuum of QCD, uh, that this is non-vanishing. So under this, uh, so what you can do is then perform an SU2 left right transformation. So here's a right anti-quark and a left quark. So this transforms to Q bar right say K R dagger K J. Then we go left um, I K prime Q K prime left. So from here, because I can't write any lower, I'm already writing too low. We can take the right and left rotate. All right, so first, what is left and right? So just to be explicit, left is a rotation. E to the I, theta left, A to the A. So some, you take, so here at TA, these are uh, poly 1, poly 2, and poly 3, because this is just SE2. And this is a, some left angle, and then similarly right. This is a transformation by some case in the right direction. And so these are just rotation matrices, which you can pull out of this matrix element. So now we have Q bar, uh, what is it, K prime, right? And this was K, Q, left, K prime. We have R, dagger, K, J, L, K prime, I. So what is this? Well, this quantity here, I can just take from the first line. This is lambda delta K, K prime. Right? I can use the chronic or delta function, and you just get R dagger K J L K I. Or I can write this as lambda 
y z. So I can bring it from left along the other side of the right, which is why I flip the indices into i z. And so you see then, and then if we want, we can define this as sigma i j. So under arbitrary left-right transformations, this doesn't vanish. And so the vacuum of QCD is not, uh, it changes. But in the special case where you take the vector subgroup, so V, what does that mean? That means theta left equals theta right. Whereas axial, you have theta left is minus theta right. So under the vector subgroup, because you have R dagger L, those phases exactly cancel. So under the vector subgroup, the QCD vacuum is invariant. The vacuum does not respect the axial symmetry. So those are the generators that get broken. So that means you predict to have parity odd and the Goldstone boson, and of course the pions are parity odd pseudoscalar. So everything fits together very nicely. And the reason I wrote this as uh, sigma is, if you recall studying the um, complex by four theory with spontaneously symmetry breaking. Spontaneous symmetry breaking, SSB for spontaneous symmetry breaking. One way you learn to parameterize these fields is rho e to the i theta, where theta is captures these rotations, right? Those are the massless modes that go around in this direction, whereas rho captures the radial mode. So if I if I could draw better, I'd draw the the wine bottle potential. So theta takes you around, and rho is the mass of excitation. So here, the sigma field, if I take out the radial excitation, the sigma field parameterizes these angles, except instead of in this simple uh, two-dimensional space, now it's in this complex SU2 space, these rotations. And so the pions can be encoded very conveniently. Just write down, and so I'm telling you all this so that as you look at the literature, you kind of have some feeling where if you're not familiar with cryo perturbation theory, where all these different fields come from, and why are the pions encoded the way they are? Where F here is the pi and the k constant. And this field phi is just a convenient way to parameterize these pi fields. So then the pions transform non-linearly under this left-right symmetry because they're stuck up in the exponential, whereas the sigma field itself transforms linearly. And so then what you can do is develop a Lagrangian that includes all possible ways to write down the sigma and the sigma dagger field. The dagger, just put a minus sign there. With derivatives, and that is chiral perturbation theory. And there's a whole systematic way to understand what operators to include to any given order of precision. And this is something you would do to compute properties of pions and kaons, which you could then compute on the lattice to determine, for example, what is F? What is the actual value for we know experimentally it's about 130 MeV in the particular parameterization I've chosen. Okay. Any questions on that? I'm going to shift slightly into perturbative. Oh, that's all right. <laughs> I've been talking too much. Sorry, five.